So thank you. Thank you very much, Ingo. So we've had um, four examples, really, of different ways of approaching measurement and accountability. We're going to have lots of opportunity to discuss it now. I'm going to invite the panel to come and sit up here. Corinna Hawkes is the new um, chair at the Centre for Food Policy at City University and also one of the expert advisors to the Food Foundation. She's going to take over as, as chair now, and we're going to try and involve you all in this conversation and get your views on what, how the UK can progress this discussion. Thanks, Corinna. Thank you. Thanks. I think I can put the microphone down. <coughs> Thanks. Thanks very much, Anna, and uh, it's great to see you all here. It really is really fantastic. Lots of familiar faces and new faces. Brilliant to see it. But uh, wow, do we have a lot of work to do having seen that. But it struck me when listening to all of those presentations, just what a new science, if you like, accountability is. And the ATNI Index, the Global Nutrition Report, um, Food Epi, these are initiatives that have been around a couple of years. They're, they're not things that have been going on a long time. So we're looking at account uh, building up new forms of accountability and learning, and learning as we go and probably making some mistakes as we go and uh, we all need to get better. But uh, when I was working on the Nourishing Framework, uh, which again is probably two years old now, uh, when I was at uh, World Cancer Research Fund International, um, it, was, um, it was a really interesting process to be identifying policies from around the world and putting them to the database because it involved a lot of conversations. Had to talk to a lot of policymakers about what they were doing. And that process in itself, I think, is helpful. Just the point of engagement to, to open up um, a conversation. But in those conversations and the numerous ones I had, it was amazing how many excuses there were not to do something. And there were so many good reasons. These were not lousy reasons, some of them were, but there were good reasons, really good reasons for not doing things. But of course, there was lots and lots of good reasons to do things. There's always going to be a good reason not to do something. So for me, what accountability is, is trying to switch that balance from moving over at the policy maker to thinking there's so many good reasons not to do something to thinking, yes, but what's more important is that there were even more good reasons to do something. It's trying to encourage that process of getting policy makers to do what they said they would do rather than finding excuses, finding excuses not to do it. So strengthening his accountability um, is what it's all about. And uh, thanks for the speakers for bringing that home. Uh, to me um, this evening. What I'd like to start with is to um, ask some questions before, uh, from the floor before, if you'll forgive me, before going um, to the panel. Um, if we have any questions for the speakers that we've heard, of, uh, heard from so far, Boyd, uh, Lawrence, um, Inga and, and Fiona, uh, just some initial questions, um, things you were curious about, remembering that uh, what we're trying to get to tonight is how we can move forward and strengthen the accountability. And after a first round of questions, and we'll get, then, go to the, then go to the panel. Any, any questions? Uh, <clears throat> my name is Fry. I'm the spokesman for the UK National Obesity Forum. Um, I thank very much Boyd Swindon uh, talking about the National Child Measurement Programme. I find it horrific that we haven't registered with UNICEF or the WHO the fact that we do have precise data on our uh, under fives. And although Lawrence Haddad was kind enough to put up the details, uh, on the actual accompanying page, which uh, I refer to, it says that uh, the United Kingdom has no applicable data. Well, that is just baloney. And if I will uh, recommend to your institute that you actually tear up this piece of paper and bring it up to date, because we do have actually precise data which could be put in the hole which says not applicable. Thank you for that point. <laughs> um, we, we can, I, I, as, as a co-chair of the DNR, I know we've got an answer for that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an answer. Don't, don't tear it up. Uh, fill in the box. Don't tear it up, fill in the box. Um, we, we haven't put garbage numbers in there, we just haven't put the numbers in there because the UN doesn't have them. So we need to get them to the UN. Well, I have to say that we have been publishing these numbers for the last 10 years. And uh, to, to find that you are producing a document which doesn't have the latest figures in it, I find not, I'm not blaming you, sir. 
Oh, well, uh, you can blame me. That's I'm fine. That's what the, accountability is all about. I'm, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm blaming the United Kingdom government, which is as slow as it is with announcing the child obesity program. And let me tell you, uh, Boyd Swinburne, you may want to know this, that we are expecting David Cameron to produce his strategy at some unspecified date before Christmas. <laughs> No, the one after next. <laughs> any, uh, any other questions at this point? Okay. So I'm going to uh, move on uh, to, to the panel here. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. Um, I'll, I'll introduce, uh, introduce you uh, one by one and, and ask a question if, if, uh, if you'll bear with me. Andrew Opie, uh, welcome. Um, Andrew is the uh, Director of Food and Sustainability at the British Retail Consortium. And his a name that's been known to me for, for many years, and it says here that he's been here since 2005. So a lot of experience at the British uh, Retail Consortium working on policies and standards. And I'd like, uh, Andrew, for you to comment on the presentations, but what, what, what can you do in the retail sector to promote more accountability? Obviously, with standards and policies, you're promoting responsibility but to take on what Boyd was saying and what, what can you do more to actually promote accountability among your members? Well I find the, um, I find the presentations really interesting actually and the talk about evaluation for me took me about five years ago when I wrote to the Department of Health and asked them what the effective evaluation the responsibility deal was going to be and I think one of the things that's framed our members approach to this obesity strategy is that five years on we yet to see a comprehensive evaluation program. I know there was some talk with the London School of Tropical Medicine around that, but it never really materialised. So I think we would definitely support that evaluation. But I think what we have got, you mentioned I've got 10 years experience. So actually, before this obesity strategy, we've been going back, we've probably got the most experience of any companies in terms of our approach to voluntary initiatives. So not just in obesity, but in waste, in country of origin labelling, anything almost that you can think of that goes on in a supermarket. So we wanted to pause and talk to our members about accountability and what would make an effective obesity strategy because as responsible companies we, we all wanted that. And that's why you might have seen some stuff in the, in the press recently. We wanted to be really clear with the government what we thought would make an effective or will make an effective obesity strategy and be very transparent about what part we were, we're prepared and can play in that. So, for example, you might have seen recently, you know, we've said a decision on sugar tax or soft drinks tax is a decision for the government, it's not for the retail sector. It's for the government to look at the evidence. They, they deal with taxation. If they decide to go for it, we'd ask them to be proportionate, but that is a decision for the government. On um, reformulation, which is something the retail sector has absolutely taken the lead. It's a real shame that Inga's never actually looked at a British retailer. To, to see how we perform, because I think we do pretty well against those companies. What we've said and taken from our experience of probably a decade working with the Food Standards Agency and then Department of Health, is the current system of voluntary initiatives does not deliver and will not deliver the quick change that you particularly need in sugar, so leading back to the second report that was published. And therefore, the way forward is mandatory targets. Mandatory targets engages everybody. It engages all food manufacturers and retailers, and everybody moves at the same pace, not penalising those companies that have actually done the right thing, which is what we found. So mandatory targets. And then finally, uh, the other issue around accountability. So everybody talks to us about promotion and marketing, uh, you know, what goes on in store. So we wanted to be really, really clear with the government, and again, you might have seen us quoted on this, that we've said to the government, do not come with a voluntary initiative on promotion and marketing for two reasons. First of all, it won't be effective because all stores, and I know Public Health England have, have made this point, all stores and outlets will not engage with that programme. And secondly, we would never be able to convene a meeting of our members to voluntarily talk about these issues because of competition law. So we wanted to get out in front of the strategy to say, don't publish something which is then destined to fail because we don't engage. And also, you know, government, you need to show the leadership here if you think that this is necessary, then you need to think about the intervention. So I think we've shifted quite a long way back to your point about accountability. We are absolutely accountable to our customers and will continue to be so. 
And our members are very proud of what they've done on reformulation. We are the only sector that has universally rolled out front pack labelling, for example. We help the Department of Health to publish that. So we are very proud of what we've done, and we will be accountable to our customers and the wider stakeholder uh, uh, sector. But what we are saying is an effective obesity policy needs to make it clear that everybody, from all food companies through to parents through to advertisers, are equally accountable. Fascinating insights there. Thank you very much. Let me move on to, to Guy Poppy. Uh, Guy is the Chief Scientific Advisor of the Food Standards Agency and has been there since um, 2014. And uh, he's originally an, an academic, a professor of ecology. And um, his, uh, his job, his current job as Chief Scientific Advisor is to ensure that scientific evidence is available to the Food Standards Agency and uh, the government upon, upon which to base sound policy. So that sounds quite important to me, making sure that, um, that, you, that the accurate scientific evidence is in the hands of government. Um, so please comment on the presentations of tonight, but what I'd be curious to know is, how do you deal with the complexity of scientific evidence, which is always going to be complex, and sometimes can that get in the way of actually, of actually um, um, of encouraging governments to take action because they can always fall back on, on an excuse that the scientific evidence is, is too complex. <coughs> okay, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think the, the last point is a very valid one, and obviously in, in the world of nutrition, which you've, we've heard a lot about tonight, um, there, there is a kind of uh, a plethora of information there which is sometimes contrasting in what it actually says. One of the things that um, I think all chief scientific advisors in government departments very strongly advocate is the use of systematic review, that what originated in the, in the Cochrane reports largely in medicine, to try and use that to try and uh, give an idea of the confidence and the certainty of the information that you're providing. So for instance in the Food Sand Agency where um, since 2010, at least in England, we don't look after nutrition anymore and, and look after safety issues, which I can obviously comment on much more. What we would have is we have a series of independent advisory committees which analyse the information, coupled with uh, in, uh, internal risk assessments, which will sometimes use systematic review. And then we will offer to the board um, a, a, an, an aspect of the certainty of the information and, and the confidence by which they can use that to make a decision. And one of the things that I've advocated since I've been in, uh, in, in place is to try and adopt the, uh, the ideas that are brought forward by people like Sir David Spiegelhalter, which introduces the idea of kind of one-star evidence to four-star evidence. So to give you some indication of that, one-star evidence might be that we do a telephone interview tonight with 100 people in London and we get an idea of how they behave in a kitchen or, or how they consume food. That is evidence, but as you can imagine, if you interview 100 people the following week, you could get very different evidence. Four-star evidence might require you to study people's patterns and behaviours over 10 years of focus groups and various kind of aspects of cultural inter, uh, uh, in, uh, impacts, etc. And that may be too long if you're trying to actually make um, decisions. So you're often in this sort of two-star to three-star um, evidence area. And I think the, uh, the other um, area of science, which I think this has been very powerful in, is in climate change. Some people may believe that hasn't actually perhaps enabled some of the changes or the actions from governments you might want. But the IPPC, in terms of their use of the quality of the evidence, I think has been very clear to people who are in a position to make decisions as to whether the evidence that's coming forward is something in which you would actually um, make a very firm decision about and feel confident that it's not likely to backfire, as against information which you might say will adopt a precautionary approach on this, but actually additional information might come in which would change our opinion. So uh, there are robust methods by which you can do that, but I think people do need to understand that not all, not all evidence is of the same quality. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, Joe Ranning, welcome. Uh, Joe is uh, the uh, Chief Operating Officer of the Jamie Oliver uh, Media Group, and she also headed up the Food Revolution team um, in 2015 and ran the political campaign for Jamie's Food Foundation. So uh, lots of uh, experience here. Um, again, please comment on what you've heard tonight in the context of how well the UK is doing in the rest of the world. 
But so tell us what, what, the, what you can do in the media to make sure that it's not just about getting noise and the front pages, but actually to get policymakers to do the boring stuff, which is less media friendly, of actually implementing and enforcing policy, even if it's several years after it was written about in the newspapers. Um, thank you very much for having me here tonight. Um, I think uh, when, I, when I consider what our role is in all of this, um, I'm incredibly grateful that this, these levels of reports and these, this global, um, these global pictures are being pulled together. It's absolutely vital for what we do that there is this firm evidence. Um, we, I think, take a position um, that uh, we, we have, we're, we're fortunate that we have a voice. Jamie has a voice. Uh, politicians listen to him, but more the people as well. He's a fantastic communicator with the people, and I feel that we can only actually stand up and uh, use our voice when we we are absolutely uh, working off this kind of evidence. And I think it's incredibly important to us and what we're doing uh, that this this stuff is is in existence. Um, in terms of the man in the street, doesn't read these reports. Um, th they probably, more of them would if they knew how to get hold of them, but I think part of what we do and what we can do in the media is um, take the headlines, simplify the messaging, and also tell real people's stories. And I think that's where, that's an incredibly powerful tool. Um, it's what we do with our documentaries. Uh, it's what we will continue to do. We will continue to take these, this amazing mass of work that... Um, is being pulled together globally and we will make it hopefully into a way, we'll tell a story to, in a way that the people can understand and therefore they become a united voice, which I do believe will shift government uh, opinion and, and hopefully see, we'll, we'll see strong policies. We've got a fantastic moment in time here. You know, the UK government do actually have an opportunity to stand up and we world leaders and put a very powerful, brave, child obesity strategy and we're all holding our breath we'll go blue in the face waiting for it um, but it's a unique it's a unique opportunity it's a chance where um, if they get it or got it right we could all actually stand up stand up and go they've done it now let's take that to the rest of the world I, I um, we wait to see what they do do um, and we'll react accordingly and we will consult I think the uh, there's a um, I think Boyd you started by saying there was huge consensus, consensus and agreement about what should be done and what needs to be done around the globe. Um, and I, I think we have an opportunity to, 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 to unite. I think we, we've really been trying to reach out. You talked about partnerships and, and pulling, people, pulling, pulling together, um, but that's what we've got. That's what we've been doing in the foundation this year. We've been talking to NGOs on a global level and we've been talking to um, uh, right the way down to right the way down to working on the ground in, in on the cities, looking at complex systems and looking at uh, how we can work on different levels. But I think that's what that's what we intend to continue doing. Did thank I answer you. your question? No. Yeah, no, no, no <laughs> thank you. It's, it's fine, fine. Uh, no, well, that, I mean, I think this shows um, how how uh, we all have a role to play in accountability in, in all our different um, aspects of our work. But but boy, just to come to you, and um, you said at the end of your talk that the UK were great leaders. Um, uh, in this area, uh, given what you've heard uh, subsequent <laughs> to that, um, we, would uh, ha ha what, what would you say to us now? Well, no, no, I think they, I think they are. It just probably says uh, a lot about the rest of the world, actually, <laughs> that they're not. <laughs> <laughs> they're far worse, but um, and we have heard stories, um, you know, Jamie's stories, the the, the retail sector, uh, periods of government when they have brought things through with the Food Standards Authority, um, the academics in in the room that are that are world leaders in their field and in food policy, uh, um, you know, Lawrence and Mike and yourself and others. I mean, this there really is critical mass here, and there is a track record of it, and there's also. Um, there's a, there's a, a culture, I think, of public health, which you don't find in all countries, I have to say. And so, uh, like it or not, actually, we look, at, we look to you guys. <laughs> well, that's a form of accountability in itself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Boyd. Thank you. Are there any uh, further questions? Uh, we'd love to have some more questions from the floor. Hi, my name's Jackie Teixeira. I've managed medical clinics and nutrition clinics the last 12 years in London. 
And one of the things we've noticed is when we take patients off dairy wheat and off a pesticide and herbicide diet, not only do they drop two dress sizes, but they come off antidepressants. It would be very interesting to see more research into the mental health benefits of an organic diet. And the pharma companies and the pesticide companies are all in a wonderful marriage because as your laborers on farms get ill from you know, administering all these various different pesticides and herbicides, they get cancer. And companies like Monsanto bury all this information. And the autoimmune systems affected by pesticides and herbicides, when patients come in with, with migraines, we take them off apples because apples have pesticides on them that cause migraines. But this information is not published. And it would be very interesting to see more research into the benefits of the organic diet. So thank it's you, not just Thank about you very much for that comment. Um, let's move on to, thank you very much, question on organic food there. Um, next question from Mike, please. Thanks. I'm Mike Rain from Oxford University. It's just a comment on this, uh, is the UK doing well or badly? I mean, I think it's a question of whether you see the pot is half full or half empty, quite frankly. Because just on one example, food labelling, um, the Food Foundation found us wanting on food labelling. Well, there are only four countries in the world that I know of that have got any sort of front about labelling system. The UK, um, Australia, New Zealand and Ecuador, which... Um, <laughs> It seems a bit unfair to say that we're doing badly. When you compare us with Ecuador, admittedly the Ecuadorian scheme is compulsory, but actually I keep on meaning to go to Ecuador to see how many packets it's on. I bet it's not on as many packets as it is in the UK. So, yeah, yeah, we're not doing well on food labelling, but quite frankly I think we're not doing that badly compared with the rest of the world, as Boyd's saying. Thank you. Mike Rayner was the um, developer of the traffic light label. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, no, there was a comment at the back. I'd like to go to you first. That was the, the third comment that was, that was put up. Sorry, sorry Mike. Uh, you were... Uh... Yeah. Could you say your name and your institution, please? Yep. Jones. Hi. Yes. Hey. Uh, Dan Jones from... Uh, thank you very much to all of the panellists. Um, one of the things that Water Aid focused on is the crucial role of water, sanitation and hygiene in tackling undernutrition and particularly stunting. Um, and we're looking at the Nutrition for Growth Summit um, being held by the Brazilian government at the Rio Olympics this year as a big opportunity on tackling malnutrition. Um, and so I just wondered if any of the panellists wanted to say a bit more about the Rio Summit as an opportunity uh, for advocacy on nutrition. Um, and Joe, I, I think I'm right in saying that the Jamie Oliver Foundation and Jamie himself are, are going to be there. Uh, it'd be great if you could say anything at all about kind of the way that Jamie is hoping to use that summit as an opportunity. Okay, so after three questions, I'd like to come back to the panel, and if any other, other speakers wanted to jump up and say something, please also go ahead. Uh, who would like to um, address uh, um, some of those questions? Jo, yeah? Shall I start? Um, yes, indeed. Uh, I, uh, water is, uh, we believe, you know, f uh, availability to drink your water and, and um, hydration is, is certainly something we, we, we put very high on our agenda. Um, uh, as I'm sure everyone knows, Jamie's put uh, the sugar tax into his own restaurants. That's going to the Children's Health Fund. Um, and I'm delighted to say the first rounds of grants uh, that the board have decided is going to be supporting water initiatives. So um, we're delighted about that. And on, in, on a UK basis, that's uh, um, something that we're very pleased is happening. Um, in terms of our uh, international strategy, um, we have indeed we've got various points in the year where we are going to be taking our international campaign. We're um, holding an event at the WHO, uh, WHA uh, in um, May, which is about uh, when we will address uh, all the world health ministers, and we will be calling on them there to um, hopefully to, to, to encourage them to, to put their own national childhood obesity strategies. And we'll be calling on, world, uh, on the health ministers to, to go home and, and to 
start writing their own and be giving them a lot of um, ideas about what they should put into them. Um, in terms of Brazil, we are working towards an event um, that will be held the day before in, at the Road to Rio um, conference. Uh, it, it, it is an evolving process, I have to say. I can't give you any clear guidelines. Um, we are in close contact with the Brazilian um, government over what's going to happen. Uh, we're in negotiation with them. I don't think they're quite clear yet. Um, as to what the day-to-day uh, -day plans are. We're hoping very much that um, we can get Jamie there um, and certainly we'll be, speaking we'll be talking um, to uh, Diffid and the organisers around it and we are working closely, you're correct about that, yeah. But we haven't got any, uh, any clear plans as yet about what we'll be calling for or what the actual agenda of that day will be. Would the other panellists like to respond to the questions? I think Lawrence probably respond to the to the Rio one, but just in relation to, to to Mike's issue, I think it is it is a bit of a challenge we found going through the food EP and getting public health people to rate how the government is doing. We're a pretty sour lot, actually. We don't give the government much credit, even when they are doing reasonably reasonably well. We're so used to them doing so badly that periodically, when they do do well, we don't give them credit where credit is due. And I think that's actually really important. It's it's something for for us to learn about ourselves and to be to be fair and reasonable in the, in the judgments. Thank you. There were some um, questions at the front here. Yes. This is the lady. <laughs> Hello, my name's Frances Hansford. Um, I'm, I'm an independent researcher based in Oxford. Um, thank you for the presentations. There was no mention of measuring and monitoring household food security and insecurity. Um, and we know that food poverty is a very real problem and an increasing problem in the UK. Um, I wonder if the panelists think that it's an important part of the monitoring and accountability framework. Um, it strikes me we've talked a lot about the food environment, but the economics have to be right as well. Um, it would also be interesting to know if there's a way of comparing with other developed country governments, so can it also be used as a comparator? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Glenn Tarman, uh, International Advocacy Director of Action Against Hunger. Uh, firstly, I just wanted to thank Joe, it's fantastic, I think, that, that Jamie's just posted to his Instagram account a call to action on Rio, and it's just got 17,000 likes. I think this is absolutely brilliant, and it's something that we're... Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to... You know, this, this is where we should be, and we're, we're certainly looking at our chef ambassadors and other popular uh, folk to, to get behind that effort to really... OK, we're waiting on Brazil in lots of different ways, but there's so much we can do. So I think this is, this is we really need to start building the momentum now, even if we're a little bit uncertain. Certainly me and uh, our, our allies have been thinking about what can the UK do, do as a donor uh, going to Rio. And I've just been sitting here thinking, why are we just thinking of the UK as a donor? It should be going to Rio with its own smart pledges about reducing malnutrition in this country. And I hadn't even thought of that. Uh, as, as part of our strategy, and I will do now. So I just, my question was, what are the smart pledges that the UK should rock up to Rio with about its own uh, situation on nutrition here? Thanks. Thank you, great question. Yeah, Simon. <coughs> Thanks, uh, Simon Catewell, University of Liverpool, and also the Faculty of Public Health. Uh, congratulations to all the panel. Um, I think the message is coming through in terms of the most effective interventions are about regulation and taxation. And Boyd has emphasized the, the consensus that's emerging. And we've seen that the recent Public Health England evidence, the Health Select Committee, uh, if the childhood obesity strategy doesn't tick all the boxes, at least we know what the boxes look like. I don't think we should beat ourselves up about the failure to beat obesity yet, because it's a tough nut. If we look at controlling sugar, then perhaps there are lessons from controlling tobacco. Uh, tobacco was recognized as a problem. It is now controlled in high-income countries. My question for the panel, finally. Uh, tobacco was controlled through the three A's, affordability, acceptability, and availability. Affordability, acceptability, availability. Are those three things equally important if we're going to control sugar, for instance? Thank you. Um, so, uh, there's some, there's some, could could we have, um, 
could the other uh, people who wanted to ask questions, could they raise their hands? Okay, just to get a sense of how many questions there are. Um, I'm going to go back to the, the panel and the speakers, but just um, fascinating questions here, but do try and be brief in your responses. And uh, if uh, Fiona Inga or Lawrence want to respond to any of them, please go ahead. Um, I'm going to try and put two of the questions together about food poverty and um, tobacco. I mean, I think our members will be very clear. We do not draw a parallel between, parallel, uh, between tobacco and sugar. So I'd say that off the bat. Um, but we do recognise, and we've put, made it clear that we do recognise there needs to be a much greater focus on sugar in the obesity strategy coming out, and particularly based on the SACEN um, report back to the PHE response to that in terms of targeting certain products and, um, and their composition. But I think on the food poverty, and I wanted to link back to the media, one of the things that we found really strange is if you look across the UK at the moment, fruit and vegetables in major uh, UK retailers have never been cheaper in real terms, ever, in this country as they are at the moment. Yet I have very rarely seen a story put in a major newspaper or in a TV programme to make that point clear. The point that is generally made is that unhealthy food is cheaper. And that may well be the case, but healthy food is absolutely affordable. And it would be nice to see more challenge of that kind of misunderstanding that it is cheaper to eat unhealthily. Now, I know that means people may need freezers. They may need the ability to be able to cook. They may need to be able to uh, purchase the products in bulk at times to take advantage of the value but it is absolutely possible and yet rarely have I ever seen that discussed openly in terms of the the affordability of healthy what we might define as healthy food versus unhealthy food thanks for that comment I think it's I think it's true that uh, your, the, the, your healthy food may be cheap but I think there's an entire generation that have lost the oh, well, ability to know what to do with yeah, it. Yeah. I, I think you know that you know we know that our children are growing up um, not knowing how to um, cook an egg anymore. Um, I think that the it's not just the children. I think we've got a generation of teachers who've also they now um, you know a lot of our teachers are in their twenties and um, they've also lost the skills. So I think food education is absolutely vital. Learn for kids to learn again, learn how to um, grow, cook, and what food does to their bodies. We've got to get that back and. Whilst it may be cheap to buy a, uh, buy a potato and a carrot, if you don't know what to do with uh, them, I, I, I could agree no more, Joe. And and I guess that shows the complexity of the yeah. obesity strategy needs to move forward. But I guess what I'm saying is the potential is there to eat healthily. Your point, absolutely right. Only if the government puts that. money behind food education. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, what I want to say is, is do a little bit of advertising. Ne next Thursday, we launch <laughs> a, a Food Future Conference, which is a piece of work that the Food Science Agency have been doing associated with their, their new strategy, which uh, one of the pillars of that is to do with the best food future possible, so to try and come w into a wider perspective than just the food safety and un unacceptable risk domain. Um, and, and in that, which I think is important, because we haven't heard a lot about it, so far is we've worked a lot with consumers and got their opinions on a range of things so um, for instance we've, we've, we've got information from 1500 people and one run two workshops one was a half day and one was a full day event in each of the capital cities in the devolved countries and, and, and we, we explored what people think in terms of their best food future and in that there's four kind of main categories which come up which kind of play to some of the things you hear here. So one of the things that people really worry about looking forward is the kind of the, the mismatch sometimes between convenience and connectivity. And, and there's a real concern about the fact that the, 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 the convenience aspect is driving many things, which is actually m removing people from food, which leads to consequences of waste and a whole range of other things as well. A second aspect is the price and quality, in which people tell us that they fear a two-tiered society, a society where the rich can afford a nutritious and healthy diet and the poor can't. This is what they're telling us. Mm -hmm. It might not be what you're saying is the case, but it's what we're being told by consumers in four capital cities of the devolved countries. 
The second, the third thing is in terms of what people kind of want, what information they want, what they want on labels, whether they want QR codes to be able to go and find off loads of information afterwards, but a small amount of information on there. And that's, that's kind of interesting messaging that you can get from that. And then finally, which was the thing which interested us, is who should do what? And what we heard from those people is that government and regulators need to be more visible in this to try and ensure that people have the best food future possible. So you can find out more next Thursday when we launch the information. We've worked with Welcome Trust, Go Science, which we've, we've had discussions with the Food Foundation. So we, we've worked with lots of other organisations to take this forward. But, but I think it's kind of worth highlighting the fact is actually it's very good, interesting and useful to go and talk to people about what they're actually doing rather than us perhaps just try to disseminate in a one-way uh, mode of action. Thank you. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more myself. Um, some questions. Oh, Lawrence, did you want to react? Yeah. I just wanted to make, just wanted to make. Thank you, uh, Corinna. I just want to make two points. Um, one is, I think the, I think the Food Foundation really should spend a lot of time monitoring food prices in the UK. Maybe you are already. Um, I'm just. This is just in response to something uh, Andrew said. Because the uh, Overseas Development Institute last year published a, a, a big study on food prices, and I was just looking at it right now, uh, and they show that very clearly in the UK, the price of fresh green vegetables has increased since 1990 in real terms, uh, and the price of ice cream and those kinds of products has decreased a lot in the last 20 years. So I think, uh, but it's a very partial database they have. They, one of the things they said was they couldn't find much, much time series data on foods. So I think whatever you can do to really get a great database on foods would be really important. The other thing is about Rio. Um, you know, Rio is a great opportunity, um, but it doesn't take a summit. You don't have to make commitments at summits. You can make commitments wherever you are, whenever you want. Um, so don't get summit obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, there were some questions at the back, at Bryony. Thank you. Bryony Sinclair from World Cancer Research Fund International. Boy, you mentioned, you mentioned in your presentation um, that existing global indicators in terms of uh, measure or track factors um, and within the food system. Um, how can we encourage the development of more agreed upon um, sort of intermediary outcomes, recognizing that single policies aren't going to address an issue as complex as obesity, but how can we track and measure of policies that are on the road to addressing issues like obesity. Thank you. Did you get that? Yeah. yeah, okay. And there was another question here. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Graham. It's Graham McGregor. I'd uh, share action on salt and sugar. But what I want to say, I'm a clinician, and I think it's very frustrating for us because we're seeing large numbers of people dying right now from strokes, heart attacks and heart failure and cancer directly due to the food we eat and particularly poorer people and we need action now and I think it's fine we heard a lot about documenting everything, getting everything properly recorded. What I want is action. We had action on salt supported by the supermarkets and that we got into the food standards agency and we're the first country to have a coherent policy to reduce salt. Population salt's fallen, population blood pressure's fallen and then they dissolve the agency, the food standards agency carrying it out because of the food industry. Uh, particularly the branded industry doing it. Now we need the same thing for obesity, we need the same thing for fruit and vegetables, and we need the same thing for saturated fat to get cholesterol down. And we could do it, and I really support Andrew and the British uh, supermarkets, they really have done a great job with salt and could do with obesity and the uh, other things. But we need Cameron to get off his back and really do something and set up an independent agency because when you think it's the biggest cause of death in the UK, why isn't there an agency dealing with this very powerful food and soft drink industry? <coughs> and somebody needs to do that and get on with it to stop all these people dying and suffering unnecessarily. Thank you. Okay, another question at the back. Uh, the gentleman there, yeah. <coughs> Jack Winkler, London Metropolitan University. A question for Andrew Opie. We've had four speakers spelling out 
a vast range of standards against which companies and uh, might be judged. Uh, which ones do you attend to, and how do your members decide which ones are important, which ones they try to conform to, which ones they can safely ignore? Thank you for the question. Let, let's uh, come to that. Uh, Andrew, would you mind asking, um, answering that now? And then we'll, we'll go to Boyd uh, for the first question and then yeah, to the others. I'm not sure I can be that precise, Jack, in the answer to that. Um, because actually, supermarkets, I mean, unlike 1,500 people, they're judged by 60 million people every year. And what they're trying to do is promote various things uh, within their brand, of which nutrition and obesity and responsible kind of sales is one part of that, alongside things like sustainability, um, ethical sourcing, lots of other areas which they would. So they are judged. Now, they all have internal standards, obviously, as you would imagine, in terms of the products that they sell within their stores. And all of those will be constantly monitoring and evaluating and changing those to reflect change in consumer demand. So in a £180 billion pound market, 0.1% market share moving one way or the other makes a massive difference. And therefore, they will have those internal standards, but they will be to reinforce their brand because that's what they're selling when you go through any of the major supermarkets. Now, I think one thing I was pleased about today, we heard about labelling, which was great, because I've not heard a lot of discussion around labelling in the run-up to the obesity strategy. We've talked a lot about advertising controls, sugar tax, various other things. We always felt that labelling, front of pack labelling, actually had two, um, two great um, advantages. First of all, it um, gives consumers a very easy choice to make, and it works really well in comparable products. So if you've got two pizzas next to one another, you can see pretty easily which one is the, is the healthier option. But secondly, it drove reformulation. So it drove category managers in those areas to remove the reds or the ambers from their products because they wanted to get those on the shelves and for them to be seen as the choice. So if I had one standard, Jack, back to your original question that I would have liked to see a little bit more discussion on when I've discussed this with NGOs, it would be support probably for front of pack labelling. Thank you. Boyd, there was a, a question for you. Yes, yeah, so it was, around the, um, it was around measuring the policies and things. And I think we've actually already shifted um, WHO and those, those groups that are measuring, um, measuring the, the, the framework. Um, the, they do have questionnaires which go to governments and they tick boxes to say what they're doing. And um, actually, it's a bit frightening what boxes they tick when you know that they're not really doing very much. So that it's like self-reporting your, your own alcohol intake or your own physical activity. You know, we tend, to, um, we tend to make best of ourselves and governments do the same, which is why I think um, having independent monitoring when the, when the thing that you're monitoring is actually really close um, to to the to, to government and to, to decisions, um, I think governments can do um, the monitoring and they do the monitoring of the diseases and the risk factors. Um, but when you start measuring things that are very close to um, to what the minister is should or shouldn't be doing or is recommended to do or not do, um, then I think you need independent monitoring. But I think we've already pushed um, WHO much be into a much better space in that sense.